Story 1 On a damp and unusually cold October evening, I found myself driving back from a friend's cabin located in the outskirts of our sleepy town. The cabin was a quaint place, nestled amongst towering pine trees, far removed from the hustle and bustle of city life. It was the perfect retreat, except for the lengthy and winding drive back. With the night growing deeper and a dense fog rolling in, my usual route home seemed daunting. That's when I remembered an old shortcut, one barely spoken of by the locals, known simply as the Forgotten Road. The Forgotten Road was steeped in an almost mythical aura, woven into the fabric of local lore and whispered about in the diners and gas stations. It was said to be an old carriage path that predated the modern roads, a direct route that slashed the journey time in half. Despite its convenience, it had fallen out of favor over the years, overshadowed by newer, wider roads that were deemed safer. On this foggy night, however, with my eyelids heavy and my mind yearning for the comfort of home, the allure of a quicker route was irresistible. Turning off the main highway, I navigated through a series of narrow, twisting lanes until I reached the unassuming entrance of the forgotten road. There was no sign, just the opening in the trees that I barely recognized from an old map I'd seen years ago. As my car bumped onto the neglected road, a sense of unease began to settle in. The fog seemed to thicken with each passing moment, enveloping my car in a ghostly shroud. The road was poorly lit, with only sporadic street lamps providing meager pools of light. These old-fashioned lamps flickered as if they were struggling to maintain their grip on life. As I drove deeper into the fog, a peculiar pattern emerged each street lamp I passed would flicker violently before succumbing to darkness. With every extinguished light, the shadows seemed to close in, making the fog appear even more impenetrable. The atmosphere was suffocating, and the silence was broken only by the sound of my car's engine and the occasional distant howl of a coyote. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, of eyes lurking just beyond the reach of my headlights. Trying to focus on the road, I reminded myself that it was just the isolation and the eerie nature of the forgotten road playing tricks on my mind. Time seemed to distort around me, the road stretched on interminably. My initial relief at taking the shortcut turned into a gnawing apprehension. Had I taken a wrong turn? Was I even still on the forgotten road? The landmarks were unrecognizable, shrouded in mist and shadow. Just when I began to contemplate turning around, the unimaginable happened, the fog abruptly lifted, as if swept away by an unseen hand. For a moment, relief washed over me, until I realized where I was. The scene before me was eerily familiar, the same gnarled tree, the same bent signpost, the same fork in the road where I had entered what I thought was the forgotten road. I had circled back to where I began, despite driving straight ahead the entire time. Confusion morphed into a chilling realization the stories about the forgotten road might have held more truth than anyone dared to admit. They spoke of a road that wasn't just forgotten by choice but actively avoided for reasons beyond mere inconvenience. It was said to be a place where the veil between worlds was thin, where travelers could find themselves lost not just in space, but in time. With my heart pounding in my chest, I decided not to tempt fate further. I turned my car around this time sticking to the main highway despite the longer drive. The fog seemed to retreat, confined to the rearview mirror, lurking around the road I had abandoned. As I finally arrived home, the first light of dawn was breaking. The ordeal on the forgotten road felt surreal, like a dream clinging to the fringes of waking memory. Yet the unease lingered, a silent whisper of the night's reality. I knew then that some paths are better left untraveled, shrouded in the mists of obscurity in the tales of the old timers. The forgotten road was one such path, a reminder of the mysteries that lie hidden in the shadows, waiting for the unwary. The next morning, a sunlight streamed through my curtains, casting long shadows on the hardwood floor. The events of the previous night replayed in my mind. The unease I felt on the forgotten road lingered like a cold residue, seeping into the corners of my waking thoughts. It was difficult to shake the feeling that something profound and unsettling had occurred, something that wasn't entirely bound by the rules of the physical world as I understood them. In an attempt to dispel the gloom that had settled over me, I reached out to a few locals over breakfast at the town diner. I hoped to glean more about the road, perhaps find some logical explanation or shared experiences that might explain the eerie phenomena. However, 
Bringing up the forgotten road elicited averted gazes and uncomfortable silences. It was clear that the subject was taboo, wrapped in layers of superstition and fear. An elderly gentleman, overhearing my inquiries, leaned over his cup of coffee and whispered urgently that some roads are best left forgotten for a reason. His words were tinged with a gravity that sent shivers down my spine. Later at the town library, I pored over old maps and newspaper clippings, searching for any clue that could rationalize my experience. The records were sparse, but one article caught my eye a faded report of a town surveyor who vanished in 1924, last seen heading towards what was then a new route through the woods. The road was meant to bring progress but instead brought sorrow and mystery, and soon after it fell out of use, shunned by the community. The more I learned, the more I felt drawn into the web of mystery surrounding the forgotten road. It was as if the road itself had a consciousness, a will to be left untouched, feared, and ultimately forgotten by those who dared to traverse its forgotten path. Story 2 Working late in the local library was not unusual for me. As a graduate student researching local history, the quiet, dusty rows of the town's old library provided both resources and refuge. Tonight, however, the library felt unusually oppressive. The shadows cast by the dim light seemed to stretch and twist into bizarre shapes. I had been transcribing notes for hours, the only sounds the soft hum of the air conditioning and the occasional rustle of pages. As the clock neared midnight, I started to pack up my things, my mind heavy with the historical complexities I'd been navigating. Just as I slung my bag over my shoulder, I paused. A soft whisper floated through the air. At first I thought it was just the wind or perhaps a trick of my fatigued mind, but then it came again, clearer this time a hushed, sibilant sound, like someone speaking just out of sight. Assuming I wasn't alone and that perhaps another patron was still inside, perhaps hidden in a remote corner engrossed in their own late night research, I called out softly, hello? Is someone there no answer came the library remained eerily silent. The whispers, however, continued, growing in intensity but still unintelligible like the murmuring of a distant crowd. Curiosity overcame my initial hesitation, and I followed the sounds, my footsteps echoing softly on the wooden floor. The whispers seemed to be moving, leading me through the labyrinth of bookshelves toward the back of the library. The air grew colder as I walked, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. Finally, I arrived at a secluded section of the library, a rarely visited area dedicated to the town's oldest records. The whispers were louder here, and as I scanned the shadowy shelves, they suddenly stopped. Before me was an old, leather-bound book, its cover plain and unmarked, resting slightly out from the shelf, as if it had been recently examined. Compelled by an unexplainable urge, I reached out and touched the book. The moment my fingers brushed the dusty cover, the library fell into a deep silence, so profound it felt as if the air itself had been sucked away. With a tentative hand, I pulled the book from the shelf and opened it. The pages were yellowed with age, the writing elegant but faded. The title page read simply, A Comprehensive History of Town's Name. As I flipped through the pages, a small, folded piece of paper fell out. I unfolded it carefully, revealing a handwritten note that read, Find the truth hidden in your roots below the message was my family's name, an unusual surname not common in the area. Perplexed and now thoroughly intrigued, I began to read the book more carefully. The history detailed within was familiar in parts but strangely different in others, mentioning events in places I had never come across in any other records. There were tales of founding families, mine among them, described with an importance and mystery that had never been hinted at in any other texts I had encountered. Hours slipped by as I absorbed the strange history, the library silent around me except for the soft ticking of the clock. As dawn approached, a particular entry caught my eye in account of a pact made in the early days of the town involving my ancestors and a mysterious other party described only as the Guardians. The details were vague, frustratingly so, but it was suggested that this pact had profound implications for the town's future and my family's role within it. The book offered no explanations about the nature of the pact or the identity of these so-called Guardians. However, it mentioned a hidden compartment within the library itself a secret place where all the answers I sought could be found. Driven by a mix of fear and excitement, I searched the section described in the book. 
Finally, hidden behind a false panel, I found another collection of documents, old letters and contracts, sealed with wax and bound in heavy leather straps. These documents told the true story. My ancestors had agreed to guard a powerful secret, one that involved the very land on which the town was built. In return, they were granted prosperity and influence, but at a cost that would echo through generations. The Guardians, it seemed, were not merely a metaphor but entities whose presence had shaped the foundational events of our town, unseen but deeply influential. As I absorbed this revelation, the whispers returned, this time as comforting as a lullaby. It seemed that touching the book had not only silenced them but had also awakened something within me a deep, inherent understanding of my family's legacy and the true history of the town. With the first light of dawn casting a pale glow through the library windows, I carefully replaced the secret documents in the old book, knowing that the knowledge they contained was for me alone, at least for now. The whispers had stopped, and in their place was a newfound sense of purpose. I left the library as the day began, the morning light erasing the shadows of the night. My research had taken on a new, personal dimension, and I knew that my connection to the town was deeper than I had ever imagined. The journey ahead would be challenging, filled with decisions about how much of this hidden truth should be revealed, and at what cost. As I stepped outside, the air fresh and clear, I felt ready to face whatever came next, armed with the secrets of the past. Story 3 the old mirror was an accidental find, tucked away under dusty boxes and forgotten trinkets in the attic of the house I had recently inherited from my late great-aunt. It was ornate, with a gilded frame that spoke of a grander time, and despite the layers of dust, it had a captivating charm. The glass was slightly fogged with age, but it gave back a clear enough reflection. Drawn to its antique beauty, I cleaned it up and hung it in my bedroom without a second thought. Every evening, it became a ritual to glance at my reflection in that old mirror before turning in for the night. It seemed innocuous, a piece of history adorning my room, yet it carried a presence, an air of silent stories waiting to be told. Tonight, however, something unsettling occurred. As usual, I paused in front of the mirror to brush my hair, lost in the monotony of the strokes. When I was about to turn away, something caught my eye a quick, almost imperceptible movement. My reflection blinked. Not a twitch or a trick of the light, but a clear, deliberate blink. I stared, frozen in shock, but it did not happen again. My reflection now mimicked my actions perfectly, as it always had, betraying no sign of the anomaly I was sure I had witnessed. The rational part of my brain scolded me, insisting it was fatigue playing tricks on my eyes. Yet, a deeper, primal fear had taken root. I stood watching the mirror for what felt like hours, daring my reflection to move again. To confirm I wasn't losing my mind. But nothing happened, and eventually my anxiety gave way to exhaustion. Unable to shake the unease and the chilling sensation of being watched, I grabbed an old bedsheet and covered the mirror. The fabric did little to ease my mind, as the feeling of a gaze upon me persisted, now seemingly from every corner of the room. That night, sleep was elusive. Every creak and whisper of the house seemed magnified as if the building itself was conscious, watching and waiting. When dawn finally broke, bringing with it the rational light of day, my fears from the night before seemed distant and foolish. Yet the compulsion to uncover the mystery of the mirror gnawed at me. I spent the morning in the local library, poring over any information that could be found about my great aunt and the origins of the mirror. The librarian, an elderly woman who had known my great aunt, recalled that the mirror had been in the family for generations, possibly brought over from Europe in the late 1800s. She mentioned, in hushed tones, that there were always rumors about that mirror, whispers of it being haunted, though she quickly laughed off such notions as silly superstitions. Armed with this knowledge, I returned home, my resolve strengthened by daylight and curiosity. I decided to speak to the mirror, feeling foolish at first as I addressed my own reflection. Who are you? What do you want? I asked, half expecting no answer. The room remained silent, the mirror impassive under its dusty sheet. As I reached out to remove the cloth, the air around me grew perceptibly colder, and the back of my neck prickled with dread. I hesitated, my hand trembling, but curiosity propelled me forward. I pulled off the sheet. The mirror was just as it had been, yet the atmosphere in the room had shifted. 
I stared at my reflection, searching for any sign of otherworldliness. And then, it happened again my reflection blinked. Not a figment of my imagination, but a clear, unmistakable blink. This time, however, it held my gaze, and its lips moved, forming words that I couldn't hear. Panic surged through me, but so did an overwhelming need for answers. I leaned in closer, speaking more firmly. What are you trying to tell me? The air vibrated, and then a whisper, so faint I could barely catch it. Look deeper. With trembling hands, I reached out and touched the mirror's surface, half expecting my fingers to pass through it. Instead, they met cold glass, but the reflection continued to gaze intently back at me, its eyes seeming to implore me to understand. I spent the rest of the day examining every inch of the mirror, eventually discovering a series of tiny, almost imperceptible engravings on the back of the frame. They were old, possibly as old as the mirror itself, written in a language I didn't recognize. I took photographs and sent them to a university contact who specialized in antique artifacts. The response came late that evening. The text was archaic, a form of old German that spoke of a binding spell one meant to trap something within the mirror. The specifics were vague, but the implication was clear something was confined within that glass, something that perhaps had been trying to communicate, or even escape. Now armed with this knowledge, I faced a moral dilemma. Should I attempt to free the entity, if that was even possible, or should I leave it trapped, a prisoner of spells cast long ago? The mirror no longer felt like an object of beauty but a relic of dark and forgotten arts. That night as I lay in bed, the sheet once again covering the mirror, the whispers returned. They were louder now, a chorus of voices, some pleading, others angry. The decision weighed heavily on me, a burden of both fear and responsibility. Whatever choice I made, I knew my nights would no longer be filled with peace, but with the whispers of the mirror. Story 4 I had recently moved into a quaint, somewhat aged apartment in a historical part of the city. The place had character, with its creaky floorboards and the musty smell of history embedded in its walls. The previous occupant, an elderly artist, had passed away, leaving behind a collection of paintings that adorned every corner of the apartment. The landlord, a distant relative of the artist, insisted that the paintings were to remain as part of the rental agreement. They were his life's work, and he wanted them to be enjoyed, he had explained. Among these works, one portrait in the hall particularly caught my attention. It was of a stern-looking man seated in an ornate wooden chair, dressed in what appeared to be turn-of-the-century attire. There was something unsettling yet mesmerizing about it. The artist had captured every crease of the man's face and the intense gaze of his eyes with such realism that it felt as though he was watching me. As days turned into weeks, I began to notice subtle changes in the portrait. At first, it was almost imperceptible, a slight graying at the temples of the man's dark hair, perhaps a few more lines around his eyes. Each morning as I passed the portrait on my way to the kitchen, the figure seemed to age, growing older, more tired. I initially dismissed this as a trick of the light, or my imagination running wild from the stress of the move and new job. However, the changes became too significant to ignore. The man's robust posture slumped, his eyes sunk deeper into his skull, and his once firm jawline softened and sagged. Concerned, I reached out to the landlord, inquiring about the history of the painting. He was perplexed and somewhat dismissive. Art can play tricks on the mind, he said, especially in different lighting. Don't let it get to you. Driven by a mix of fear and curiosity, I attempted to remove the portrait from the wall to inspect it for any mechanical devices or optical illusions that might explain the phenomenon. But the portrait was inexplicably heavy, immovable, as if it had been welded to the wall. No matter how much I tugged or pried, it wouldn't budge. One particularly eerie morning, after a restless night filled with dreams of the aging man whispering incoherently, I found the painting had changed once again. The figure was gone leaving behind the empty chair and a backdrop of the drab, dark-walled room. The sudden disappearance of the figure sent chills down my spine. Where had he gone? Was he coming back? That day, the apartment felt oppressively claustrophobic, 
and the air seemed thick with tension. As the sun set, shadows played across the walls, and the temperature dropped noticeably as I passed the hallway. The sense of being watched, which I had attributed to the stern man in the portrait, did not diminish with his absence. If anything, it intensified. Sleep became elusive. At night, I would hear rustling sounds, faint mutterings, and sometimes a soft thump, like a heavy object settling. Each morning, I would hesitantly check the portrait, half expecting, half dreading to see the figure return to his original place. But he never did. The chair remained empty. Desperate for answers and losing any semblance of peace in my own home, I turned to researching the previous occupant of the apartment. I visited the local library, poring over newspaper archives and death records. What I found deepened the mystery. The artist was known for his eccentricity and reclusiveness, rarely seen by locals and disinterested in selling or exhibiting his work. He was said to have dabbled in various obscure arts and was obsessed with capturing the essence of the human soul on canvas. My research led me to a small, tucked away antique shop where the artist was rumored to have acquired unique paints and materials. The shopkeeper, a gnarled old man with knowing eyes, listened to my story with a nod. Ah, he was trying to make a masterpiece, one that could transcend the very concept of time, he said cryptically. He believed that a true artist could capture life itself, maybe even cheat death. The implications of his words were terrifying. Had the artist somehow trapped the essence of a living person within the painting? Was the aging of the figure in the portrait a representation of this person's life force slowly deteriorating? And now that the figure was gone, what had become of this essence? I left the shop with more questions than answers. When I returned home, the atmosphere of the apartment seemed to have shifted once again. The painting was as I had left it, the chair empty. But tonight the emptiness felt final, as if whatever had been confined within the painting had finally found release, or perhaps it simply faded away. As days passed, the oppressive feeling in the apartment dissipated. The whispers and nocturnal disturbances ceased and the air no longer grew cold as I passed the hallway. Whether it was my actions or simply the passage of time that brought about this change, I couldn't say. I eventually moved out of the apartment, leaving the portrait behind as per the lease agreement. To this day, the memory of that portrait haunts me. I sometimes wonder about the essence of the man in the chair, hoping that his release from the canvas brought him peace, rather than a new form of entrapment. As for me, I continue to look over my shoulder, a part of me always searching the shadows for a glimpse of the figure who once watched from the wall. Story 5 The decision to renovate the old family home wasn't taken lightly. Nestled on the edge of our small town, the house had been in my family for generations, each adding their own layers of memories and history to its walls. When I inherited it from my grandparents, the home was showing its age, with creaking floors and peeling paint but it was the house where I had spent countless summers as a child. It felt only right to restore it, to breathe new life into the time-worn spaces. The renovations began in early spring. The plan was to update the essentials without stripping away the home's rustic charm. I worked closely with the contractors, ensuring every change respected the original architecture. During the demolition of one of the upstairs walls, a discovery brought everything to a sudden halt. The contractor called me over, his face a mixture of confusion and intrigue. You might want to see this, he said, pointing to a small compartment hidden behind the old plaster. Inside the compartment were dozens of yellowed envelopes, carefully tied together with a faded ribbon. My curiosity piqued, I gently untied the ribbon and pulled out the topmost letter. The handwriting was elegant, a flowing script that seemed to dance across the page. But it was the name signed at the bottom that sent a shiver down my spine, it was my own name. Unmistakably, even more startling was the date exactly 100 years ago. Over the next several days, I read through the letters, each one revealing details of a life uncannily similar to my own. The writers spoke of childhood memories in the house, of secret hideaways and whispered stories, echoing my own experiences. There were mentions of family gatherings, lost loves, and personal triumphs and tragedies that mirrored events in my life so closely it was as if I were reading pages from a forgotten diary. The letters painted a vivid picture of the writer's time, the daily rhythms of a bygone era. 
yet the familiarity of the emotions and experiences detailed within bridged the century gap between us. But it was the final letter in the collection that truly unsettled me. It was different from the others, more urgent, and it contained a warning. Beware the cellar door that sticks, do not open it without fixing its frame at red. A grave mistake lies in wait for those who do. This warning was particularly disturbing because, just the day before, I had planned to address a problem with that very door. It had always been troublesome, jamming frequently, and I had finally arranged for someone to repair it. Reading this warning, written a century ago by someone with my name who seemed to know my life, was surreal. Determined to understand more, I began to delve deeper into the history of my family and the house. Local archives turned up census records and old newspapers that mentioned my ancestors, but nothing explained the letters or their prophetic nature. The town's historian, an elderly man with an encyclopedic knowledge of local lore, listened to my story with a furrowed brow. Time is strange ways of revealing its secrets, he mused. This house has always been a bit of an enigma. Fueled by a mix of fear and fascination, I decided to heed the warning in the letter. The next day, I asked the contractor to thoroughly inspect the cellar door's frame before attempting to repair it. As he removed the surrounding wall, we discovered the reason for the door's persistent jamming a severely rotted frame that was structurally unsound. Lucky we caught this, he remarked. Could have been a nasty collapse. With the mystery of the warning resolved but the origin of the letter still unexplained, I felt a deep connection to my home and my unknown ancestor, whose life had so closely mirrored my own. The letters were stored safely, a tangible link to the past that I would treasure and protect. The renovations continued, the house gradually transformed yet still whispering echoes of its history. I often wandered through the rooms, the letters descriptions so vivid in my mind that I could almost see the shadows of those who had lived here before moving through the spaces, their laughter and voices mingling with the modern sounds of restoration. The house once fully renovated, felt rejuvenated, a harmonious blend of past and present. I hosted a family gathering to celebrate, inviting relatives who shared our ancestors' blood. The house was filled with the warmth of shared stories and reminiscences, the walls absorbing new memories to add to the old. In the end, the letters remained an unexplained mystery, but one that had brought me closer to my roots and given me a deeper appreciation for the continuity of life. They reminded me that our connections to the past are not just through blood or names, but through the shared human experiences that transcend time. Story 6 For weeks the routine was the same. Every night, as the clock's hands aligned at midnight, my phone would ring exactly once. Each time, the glowing screen showed an unknown number, a string of digits that didn't match any pattern or region code I recognized. At first, I dismissed the calls as a glitch or a persistent wrong number, but the precision of the timing piqued my curiosity and unease. The calls left no voicemails, and attempts to return the number resulted in a deadline, offering only an impersonal tone and a message that the number could not be reached. I discussed it with friends and even joked about it at work, but the humor did little to mask the underlying ripple of anxiety. The nightly disturbances began to disrupt my sleep, each ring a sharp note slicing through the quiet of my apartment, leaving behind a lingering sense of being watched. Driven by a mix of fear and an overwhelming need for answers, I decided to answer the call one night. As the clock neared midnight, I sat awake, phone in hand, staring at its screen as if I could will the mystery caller to reveal themselves. The ring came, sharp and insistent as always. I answered. The line was filled with a heavy, labored breathing. It wasn't the breath of someone winded, but something more unsettling, a deliberate and controlled inhale and exhale that sent shivers down my spine. I managed to stammer a hesitant, hello but received no reply, only the continued sound of breathing. After what felt like an eternity but lasted only seconds, the caller hung up. The silence that followed was suffocating. The fear and curiosity that had driven me to answer transformed into something darker a realization that someone, somewhere, was reaching out to me in the most invasive way. I did not sleep that night, nor did I receive another call. The following night, as midnight approached, I watched the phone anxiously, but it remained silent. Days passed without further calls. 
The disruption to my routine should have been a relief, yet the absence of the ring only heightened my anxiety. Had answering the call escalated the situation? It was the caller watching, planning their next move. I felt exposed and vulnerable in my own home. Seeking some form of reassurance or protection, I contacted the police. They took my statement and promised to trace the calls, but their nonchalant attitude suggested they saw no immediate threat. The officer advised me to change my number, a solution that felt like an admission of defeat, a concession to the unseen tormentor. Unable to settle the turmoil within, I began my own investigation. I researched the number online, finding others who had experienced similar mysterious calls. Forums and threads dedicated to phone scams and paranormal occurrences provided no answers but fueled my growing obsession with finding the truth. My research led me to a tech-savvy friend who agreed to help trace the call. His equipment was more sophisticated than the standard tools available online. After several attempts and much technical maneuvering, we managed to trace the call to an old, disused warehouse on the outskirts of town. The building was part of a complex that had been abandoned for years, rumored to be a hub for unsavory activities until it was shut down. Driven by a need to end this once and for all, I decided to visit the warehouse. The day was overcast, clouds hanging heavy with the threat of rain, mirroring the dread that filled me. As I approached, the size and desolation of the warehouse became apparent. Graffiti covered its walls and broken windows gaped like dark eyes watching me. Inside, the air was stale, the silence punctuated by the distant drip of water. The place was a labyrinth of corridors and rooms filled with the detritus of its previous lives overturned furniture, scattered papers, and remnants of illegal encampments. In the main office, a bank of dusty, old-fashioned phone equipment sat like a relic of a forgotten era. It was here, amidst the cobwebs and decay, that my midnight calls had originated. On the floor, Amidst a pile of old phone books and technical manuals, was a cell phone its screen cracked and its casing covered in dust. It was an old model, one that had no business being in use today. Picking it up, I realized with a sinking heart that this was the source of the calls. The phone's log showed one number dialed over and over a haunting loop that had targeted me. The discovery was a relief but left me with more questions than answers. Who had placed the phone there, and why? The warehouse offered no clues, its secrets as tightly locked away as its past occupants. I reported the find to the police, who took the phone and promised to look into it, but I knew that was likely the end of it. The calls stopped, and life slowly returned to normal, but the experience left a mark on me. I was more cautious, more aware of the fragility of my privacy. The phone... The warehouse, the midnight calls, they were all echoes of a past that had briefly reached out into my present, a reminder of how easily one can be haunted by shadows. As I moved forward, I knew I would always be listening, half expecting the ring of a phone in the dead of night, a call from nowhere. Story 7 Hiking had always been my way to escape the mundane pressures of daily life. The forest surrounding our town was vast and untouched, a remnant of ancient wilderness that promised solitude and peace. Yet, recently my treks through these woods had become anything but peaceful. I felt a presence, an inexplicable sensation of being watched that clawed at the edges of my comfort. At first, I chalked it up to the natural paranoia that comes from being alone in a large, dense forest. The rustle of leaves or the snap of a twig could easily be the wind, or a deer moving stealthily through underbrush. But as the weeks passed, the feeling intensified, a constant prickle at the back of my neck, a gaze I could almost touch but never quite catch. Then, one crisp autumn afternoon, I saw a figure, distant and indistinct, standing motionless between the trunks of two massive old pines. It was so still, so blended with the shadows, that I might have missed it had I not felt its eyes on me, drawing my own gaze. The figure was shrouded in a dark cloak, or so it seemed, making it nearly invisible against the dark underbrush and the fading light. I blinked, 
and it was gone, as if it had never been there at all. I tried to dismiss it as a trick of the light or a figment of my imagination, but the image haunted me, that silhouette between the trees watching. I had to know if it was real, so I decided to bring a friend along on my next hike, thinking a second pair of eyes might either confirm my fears or laugh them away. Max was an old college friend, a rational mind with a skeptic's heart. He agreed to accompany me, intrigued by my story. As we walked the familiar trails, I recounted my experiences, pointing out the spots where I often felt watched and where I had seen the mysterious figure. Max listened, nodding, his eyes scanning the woods around us. It's easy to feel watched out here, he said, his voice a mix of understanding and skepticism. These woods have a way of playing tricks on your mind. Everything is so still, so quiet. As we approached the area where I had last seen the figure, I felt a surge of anxiety, hoping to finally have some validation. We reached the spot, and I pointed between the trees. Right there, between those two pines, that's where I saw. But there was nothing there now, just the empty space and the quiet forest. Max squinted into the distance, then shrugged. I don't see anything, but these woods do have a creepy vibe. Let's keep going. We moved on, but the rest of the hike felt off. The woods seemed denser, the shadows deeper. We spoke little, each absorbed in our own thoughts. By the time we returned to town, the sun had dipped below the horizon, leaving a chill in the air that hadn't been there when we started. A few days later, Max called me. His voice was tense, lacking its usual calm. I've been seeing it too, he said. The figure you talked about. I thought you were just messing with me, but I went back to the woods yesterday and I saw something. A figure standing far off between the trees, just watching. And now I feel like I'm being watched, even outside the woods. His admission sent a cold shiver through me. The phenomenon wasn't just my imagination, it was real, and now it was affecting Max too. We decided to delve deeper, to try to understand what or who was watching us. Together we spent days researching the history of the forest, speaking with locals, and scouring old newspapers for any clues. Our efforts led us to an old man, Mr. Hamlin, who had lived near the woods all his life. When we asked him about our experiences, his face grew somber. You've seen the Watcher, he said, his voice a whisper. Folks around here used to talk about it more, years ago. It's an old story, a spirit of the woods, they said, watching over the forest. Some say it's a guardian, others a harbinger. It appears to those who it deems, significant somehow. But why, as Max asked, his skepticism fading in the face of this old man's solemnity. Mr. Hamlin shook his head. That I can't say. Sometimes it's to protect, other times to warn. The forest has its own way of communicating with us. You might not understand its reasons, but you should listen. Be cautious. His words resonated with us, adding a layer of mystic dread to our encounters. We continued our hikes, but now with a new purpose. We watched as much as we were watched, always seeking the figure, always aware of its eyes on us. Months passed, and while the figure remained elusive, the sensation of being watched never left us. It became a part of our lives, a constant reminder that we were part of something larger and more mysterious. The woods no longer felt merely like a refuge from the world they felt alive, filled with intention and secrets. The Watcher never showed itself clearly again, but its presence influenced every hike, every foray into nature. We respected the woods more, understood that we were mere visitors in a land that was ancient and aware. Whether guardian or harbinger, the Watcher in the woods had changed us, opening our eyes to the unseen and the unexplained, forever altering our connection to the natural world around us. Story 8 When I moved into the old Victorian house on the edge of town, 
It was under the heavy burden of starting anew after a difficult few years. The house, with its steep gables and wraparound porch, seemed like just the right place to heal and find peace. It was a charming house, though it carried a weight, a sense of history and lives long past. I spent the first few weeks unpacking and settling in, turning the house into a home. It was during this process, in a small, overlooked room that I intended to turn into a study, that I found the diary. It was tucked away in a built-in drawer of the desk that came with the house, hidden under a false bottom that I discovered accidentally. The diary was old, the leather cover worn and the pages yellowed with age. Curiosity peaked, I opened it to the first page and began to read. The handwriting was neat, almost meticulous, but it carried a hurried undertone, as if the writer was pressed for time or perhaps eager to document their thoughts. The entry dates were from many years ago, yet as I delved deeper into the diary, I found myself growing increasingly unsettled. The writer described the house in intimate detail, not just the architecture or the idyllic garden, but personal experiences, moments, and feelings that mirrored my own. Events like the peculiar way the third step from the top of the main staircase always creaked louder than the others, or how the morning light cast ghostly shadows in the upstairs hallway. These were things I had noticed since moving in, subtle quirks that I had thought of as unique to my own experience. But it was more than that. The writer spoke of chilling drafts that seemed to come from nowhere, the scent of lilacs in mid-autumn when no lilacs grew nearby, and the soft whispering sounds at night that could be dismissed as the house settling or not. Each entry detailed events that I had, to my growing horror, experienced myself. As I continued reading, the entries began to take on a darker tone. The writer described feelings of being watched, of seeing shadows flit just beyond the corner of their eye, and the growing sense of unrest. They wrote about the history of the house, how it had been passed down through generations, each owner adding to the diary, recounting similar experiences, each one leaving when the burden of the house's past became too much to bear. The final entry was the most disturbing. The writer concluded that the house, while beautiful and filled with character, carried a heaviness that was palpable, a tapestry of past lives that lingered in the very wood and stone. They wrote of their decision to leave, to find peace beyond the walls that seemed to echo with memories not entirely their own. The entry ended with a haunting invitation, or perhaps a warning I leave this diary, this record of life within these walls, to the next keeper. May you find the courage to continue what I could not. Sitting in the quiet of the study, the diary in my lap, I felt a chill run down my spine. The realization that I was now part of this strange legacy was overwhelming. I placed the diary back in its hiding place, a sense of unease settling deep within me. Over the next few days, I tried to dismiss the diary as the ramblings of a previous owner who perhaps had too active an imagination, but the house seemed to respond to my disbelief by amplifying all the little oddities I had tried to ignore. The whispers grew louder, the shadows darker, and the sense of being watched more pronounced. Determined to understand the history of the house, I started researching its past owners the local library held archives of the town's history, and there I found mentions of the house and its many occupants. Each had been a prominent figure in the town at one time or another. Each had lived in the house for a relatively short period, and several had left town altogether after their stay. Armed with this knowledge, I returned to the house with a new perspective. It wasn't just a building, it was a vessel holding decades, perhaps centuries, of energy and emotions, and like the owners before me, I was now intricately tied to its legacy. I decided to embrace the role that the house had bestowed upon me. I returned to the diary, reading it again, this time with a sense of purpose. I added my own entries, documenting my experiences and feelings, continuing the narrative that had been left for me. 
Months turned into years and I found a strange comfort in the house. Knowing its quirks and understanding its history allowed me to appreciate its uniqueness. The diary became a trusted confidant, a place where I could lay down the weight of my experiences. Eventually though I understood what the previous occupants had known the house, for all its beauty and intrigue, was a keeper of echoes, a mirror reflecting the past lives of its inhabitants. And like those before me, I realized my time there was drawing to a close. The house needed a new keeper, someone to add their chapter to the ongoing story. As I packed my belongings, preparing to pass the house on to the next owner, I left the diary where I had found it, in the secret compartment of the desk in the study. In it, I penned my final entry, an echo of the past, a bridge to the future. To the next who calls this place home, this diary is yours now. Continue the legacy, add your voice to the whispers of the house. May you find peace within these walls and may you too learn when it is time to move on. Story 9 The road home from work was one I could drive with my eyes closed, not that I ever would. It was the same series of turns, the same landmarks passing by day after day, a comforting routine in the otherwise unpredictable whirl of daily life. But one evening, something changed. It was subtle at first, barely noticeable a feeling of disorientation, a sense that something was amiss. I arrived home an hour later than usual that night. The clock on the dashboard read 7.05 p.m. when it should have been just after 6 p.m. I had no explanation for it, my mind was a blank slate. There were no traffic delays, no accidents on the route, nothing that should have delayed me. It was as if time itself had slipped, folded in a way that science couldn't explain. At first I brushed it off as a fluke, perhaps a momentary lapse in attention. But then it happened again, and again, each time the same loss of an hour, the same gap in my memory. It became a pattern, a disturbing regularity that I couldn't ignore. I felt fine otherwise, no signs of illness or fatigue. It was just those lost hours, unaccounted for and irretrievable. Driven by a mix of concern and curiosity, I decided to record my drives. I set up a dashboard camera, making sure it was fully charged and had enough memory to cover the entire journey. I needed to understand what was happening during those lost hours, to see for myself what I was doing during the time I couldn't remember. The first few recordings showed nothing unusual, just my usual drive home, the roads relatively quiet, the commute uneventful. But then, one evening it captured something that chilled me to the bone. The footage showed me driving my usual route, but midway through I pulled over to the side of the road. Then, inexplicably I just sat there, my car parked, staring blankly ahead. There was no recognition in my eyes, no sign of awareness. I just sat, motionless, lost to the world, for exactly one hour. Then, as suddenly as I had stopped, I started the car again and continued on my way home as if nothing had happened. Watching that footage was like watching a scene from a movie about possession or alien abduction genres I had always scoffed at but now seemed terrifyingly plausible. What was happening to me during that hour? Where did I go, mentally? And why couldn't I remember any of it? I showed the footage to a few trusted friends and family members. They were as baffled as I was, suggesting everything from medical issues to supernatural explanations. I sought out a doctor, undergoing tests to rule out neurological conditions. All results came back normal, there was no medical reason for my blackouts. The situation grew more distressing with each occurrence. The fear of not knowing what was happening during those lost hours began to affect my life. I was afraid to drive, worried about what I might do or where I might go during one of these episodes. But I needed answers. Desperation led me to seek out less conventional avenues. I contacted a psychologist who specialized in hypnotherapy, hoping that perhaps I could unlock the secrets of my lost time through regression. 
During these sessions, I tried to relax as the therapist Garapist guided me back to those moments, trying to peel back the layers of my subconscious. Under hypnosis, I described an overwhelming sense of being pulled away from reality, a force that drew me into a deep, dark silence. But there were no specific details, nothing that could explain why I stopped my car and sat staring vacantly. The therapist suggested it might be a dissociative response to stress, a theory that sounded plausible but incomplete. It didn't explain the regularity, the exact hour lost, or why it only happened on my drive home. Running out of scientific explanations, I turned to the local history of the area, delving into the library archives. That's when I stumbled upon an old legend about the lost road according to local folklore. A stretch of road that overlapped part of my daily route was cursed. The legend told of a wandering spirit, lost between worlds, who would occasionally pull mortals into its lonely vigil, causing them to lose time as they shared in its eternal weight by the roadside. The story seemed like nothing more than a ghost tale, the kind spun around campfires and in the dark corners of pubs. Yet, it resonated with me, echoing the eerie truth of my experiences. Perhaps it was the sheer lack of any other explanation that made me consider it, or maybe it was the desperate need to cling to any semblance of understanding. I decided to alter my route home, taking a longer, less direct path that completely avoided the area mentioned in the legend. The first night I tried this, I waited anxiously to see if it made a difference. To my profound relief, I arrived home with no gap in my memory, no lost time. It was the same for the next night and the night after that. Had I broken the curse, or had I merely sidestepped it, I wasn't sure and I wasn't about to test it by reverting to my old route. I had found a solution, albeit an unconventional one, and that was enough for me. In time, the fear and anxiety diminished. I shared my story in a local online forum and discovered others who had experienced similar unexplained phenomena on the same stretch of road. We formed a small community, sharing stories and support a group of people bound by a peculiar twist of fate or perhaps something beyond our understanding. As for the diary and the camera, they remained safely stored away, artifacts of a chapter in my life that I hoped was firmly behind me. I couldn't explain what had happened, and perhaps I never would. But I had found peace, and sometimes in life, that's the most elusive answer of all. Story 10 The tradition of hosting monthly dinner parties began as a way to stay connected with friends in the bustling rush of city life. My apartment, a cozy yet elegant space with a view of the downtown skyline, was the perfect setting for these gatherings. The dining table, a beautiful antique I had painstakingly restored, could comfortably seat eight, which was ideal for the intimate, lively dinners I loved to host. One evening, as I was setting the table in preparation for the night's event, I noticed an oddity in extra place setting. A ninth plate, complete with silverware and a crystal wine glass, had been placed at the table. I stood puzzled, certain I had only set out eight, matching the number of RSVPs. Shrugging off the mistake as a lapse in my own attention, I removed the extra setting and continued my preparations. As the guests arrived, Laughter and conversation filled the apartment, pushing the odd incident to the back of my mind. Dinner was served, and the evening unfolded beautifully. However, as I glanced around the table, the feeling of something being amiss crept over me. It was a subtle sense of displacement, as if the air around us was charged with an unexplained expectancy. The following month, the same thing happened again An extra setting appeared on the table as I finished preparing. This time I was sure I hadn't placed it there. The silverware was slightly different, an older style that didn't match any I owned. With a nervous laugh, I removed the pieces, attributing the occurrence to forgetfulness or stress. 
But it was during the third incident that reality took a sharp and chilling turn. Once again, the extra place setting was there, but as I reached out to clear it, I froze. There, in the chair, was the indistinct outline of a figure. Its features were blurred, the edges of its form hazy and shifting subtly, as if caught in a perpetual state of becoming. I blinked, and it vanished. The dinner that night was unnerving. Guests chatted and enjoyed the meal, but several mentioned feeling uneasy, as though we were being watched. Their words sent a shiver down my spine, echoing my own disquiet. I couldn't shake the vision of the blurred figure from my mind, its presence both haunting and enigmatic. Determined to uncover the truth, I began to investigate the history of my apartment and the antique dining table. The building was old, dating back to the early 1900s, and had been through many incarnations before being converted into apartments. The table, I discovered, was even older, a family heirloom from a grand estate sale. Delving deeper, I found a troubling story connected to the table. It originally belonged to a wealthy family, the Harrows, known in their time for extravagant social events. According to an old newspaper clipping, a tragic incident occurred during one of these gatherings a guest, a young woman, had mysteriously disappeared after last being seen at a dinner party. The case had remained unsolved, her fate unknown. Intrigued and disturbed by this revelation, I felt compelled to reach out to someone who might understand these strange occurrences. A local psychic, known for her sensitivity to the past lives of objects, agreed to visit and read the table. The night of her visit, I prepared the table as usual, this time leaving the ninth setting untouched. The psychic, a middle-aged woman named Mrs. Alder, arrived just as the sun was setting, casting long shadows across the room. She was silent for a long moment after entering the dining area, her eyes intently studying the table and the extra setting. Finally, she spoke, her voice soft but clear. There's a presence here, tied to this table. A soul left in limbo, searching for closure. She doesn't mean harm, but she is bound to this artifact, replaying her last moments, seeking acknowledgement. Mrs. Alder's words hung heavy in the air as she began her session, her hands hovering over the table, her eyes closed in concentration. I watched, a mix of skepticism and hope stirring within me. As she worked, the temperature in the room dropped perceptibly, a sign misses. Alder noted as significant. She's here, she whispered, confused and scared, but she's here. The psychic then addressed the empty chair, speaking words of comfort and guidance, urging the lost soul to move on, to leave the bindings of her tragic past behind. The air around us seemed to pulse with a silent energy the feeling of being watched intensifying until it was almost unbearable. Then, just as suddenly it lifted. The room warmed, the oppressive feeling dissipated, and the psychic opened her eyes, smiling gently. It's done. She's gone to rest now. The tie has been broken. The relief was immediate and profound. I thanked Mrs. Alder for her help, feeling a weight lifted from my shoulders. From that night on, the extra place setting no longer appeared. My dinner parties resumed, the joy and laughter returning without the undercurrent of unease. However, I never forgot the uninvited dinner guest and the lesson she brought with her that some remnants of the past linger close, seeking resolution, not out of malice, but out of a deep-seated need to be acknowledged and remembered. Story 11 The quaint old house where my grandmother had lived her entire post-marriage life was a testament to her tastes in the era she lived through. After her passing, the house was left to me, her only grandchild, who cherished countless memories of summer vacations spent in its comforting embrace. The house, with its Victorian trims and an overgrown rose garden, was located in a quiet part of town a relic surrounded by more modern homes. 
Over the years, as I grew older and my life became busier, my visits to the house grew infrequent. Yet, each time I crossed its threshold, a flood of nostalgia would wash over me. Sometimes, as I wandered through the familiar rooms, I would catch a whiff of my grandmother's perfume, a distinctive, floral scent that seemed to linger in the air long after she had gone. At first, these occurrences were fleeting, easy to dismiss as my imagination or memories playing tricks on me. But one autumn weekend, while I was cleaning out some old storage boxes in the attic, the scent was overpowering, undeniably real. It was as if my grandmother had just passed by. The aroma was so strong and so clear that it sparked a curiosity in me that I couldn't ignore. I felt compelled to find the source. The fragrance seemed to lead me down the attic stairs and along the second floor hallway. It was a path I had walked many times before, but today it felt different, charged with a purpose. Following the scent, I noticed it grew stronger near a wall at the end of the hallway a dead end I had always assumed was just that. But today, hidden partly behind an old tall armoire that hadn't been moved in decades, I found a small door I had never seen before. It was oddly placed, low and narrow, almost as if it was meant to be overlooked. With a mixture of excitement and trepidation, I pushed the armoire aside. The door was painted the same color as the walls, aiding its concealment. As I opened it, a rush of cool air greeted me, carrying the rich floral notes of my grandmother's perfume. Inside, I discovered a room preserved in time. It was as if I had stepped back into an era when my grandmother was still a vibrant hostess of the house. The room was small and intimate decorated with wallpaper of soft pastels, furniture draped in dust covers, but all unmistakably from her younger days. There were photographs in ornate frames, images of my grandparents in their youth, smiling, forever captured in a moment of joy. A dressing table sat against one wall, bottles of perfume lined up like soldiers at parade rest, with one in particular a cut crystal bottle with a faded golden label that I recognized as the source of the scent. Every object in the room told a story, a piece of my grandmother's history that I had never known. Among the treasures was a journal, its leather cover cracked with age, filled with her neat script. I sat on the floor of the journal in my lap and began to read. With each page, her voice seemed to echo around the room, bringing her back to life through her words. She wrote about the joys and sorrows of her life, her dreams and disappointments, and her love for my grandfather, which never waned even after his early demise. This room, she revealed, was her private sanctuary, a place to keep her memories alive, to speak with him in her heart when the world outside became too much to bear. After his death, she found solace here, surrounded by the remnants of their life together, until she too found it painful to continue the tradition in her old age. I spent hours in that room, surrounded by the remnants of a past I had only glimpsed through stories and faded photographs. The sun had set by the time I emerged, the journal clutched in my hand, my heart heavy with love and loss. The house, once just a place of childhood adventures, now held a deeper significance. It was a repository of my family's legacy, of love, and of the enduring connections that transcend even death. The discovery of the sealed room changed my relationship with the house. Instead of a burden of maintenance and memories too painful to confront, it became a treasure chest, a tangible connection to my grandparents. I decided to preserve the room just as it was, a museum of their lives and love. Over time, the scent of my grandmother's perfume faded until I could no longer catch it in the air. Maybe it was tied to the room. A final farewell as I uncovered her sanctuary, or perhaps it was simply time for the past to settle leaving me to move forward. But in my heart and in the fabric of that old house, my grandmother's presence remained as tangible and comforting as ever. Story 12 For several weeks I had been awakened each night by the faint strains of a melody, 
as elusive as a dream yet persistent enough to rouse me from sleep. The song was unfamiliar, a haunting tune that seemed to drift through the walls of my apartment, weaving through the stillness of the night with an eerie grace. Despite my best efforts to ignore it or rationalize it away as the remnants of a neighbor's late night entertainment, the music continued, each night beginning at precisely 3.07 a.m. My apartment, an old but well-kept unit in a building that had seen better days, was usually a haven of quiet in the bustling city. But this music, with its melancholy notes, had begun to fray my nerves. One night, driven by a mix of frustration and an unshakable curiosity, I decided to find its source. I rose from my bed when the first note seeped into my room. The sound seemed to float on the air, ethereal and directionless, so I followed the melody down the hallway of my apartment. The tune led me from room to room, never louder nor softer, always just on the edge of clarity. I checked my phone, my laptop, every device capable of producing sound, but found them all turned off. Eventually, my search brought me to the living room, a cozy space filled with the shadows of furniture and stacks of books. There, in the far corner, sat an old radio on a small table in 1940s Zenith, its wooden frame dusty and its dial faded. I remembered finding it in the attic when I first moved in, a forgotten relic of the building's past occupants, and had placed it there for decoration. The radio wasn't plugged in. There were no batteries where batteries could go, nothing to suggest it could function, yet the music was undeniably emanating from its speakers. As I approached, the haunting tune filled the room, surrounding me with its melancholic notes. Tentatively, I reached out and touched the dial. Instantly, the song changed. Now the soft, familiar notes of my favorite childhood tune filled the air a song my mother used to hum as she rocked me to sleep. The sudden shift from haunting melody to this comforting tune sent a shiver down my spine. How could this radio, unpowered and isolated, play this deeply personal song? Compelled to understand, I spent the next day researching the history of the radio in the building. The super, an elderly man who had been looking after the building for decades, was a wellspring of stories. When I asked about the radio, his face took on a wistful expression. Oh, that old thing, he said, his voice tinged with nostalgia. Belonged to Mrs. Henley, lived here back in the 40s. Loved her music, she did. Played that radio day and night, always said music was her connection to the world beyond. World beyond, I asked, intrigued. Yep, she was a bit of a mystic, believed in spirits and all that said the radio helped her speak to them. When she passed, nobody had the heart to get rid of it. Guess it just stayed forgotten. Armed with this knowledge, I returned to my apartment, a plan forming in my mind. If Mrs. Henley had used the radio as a medium, perhaps it was still serving that purpose, maybe the radio was channeling more than just residual energies. That night, as 3.07 a.m. approached, I sat before the radio, a digital recorder set next to me. The initial tune began to play, the same haunting melody as before. I reached out, touching the dial to shift the music to the childhood song that brought me such comfort. This is Jacob, I spoke aloud, addressing the unseen forces that might be listening. I don't know if I'm reaching anyone, or if this is just some echo of the past, but I want to understand. Why do you play these songs? I asked my questions into the quiet, the only response being the gentle melody from the radio. After a while, I stopped feeling slightly foolish but hopeful that something might have been captured on the recorder. When I played back the recording, amid the static and the clear notes of my childhood tune, there was a voice, barely a whisper remember. Chilled yet fascinated, I spent many nights by the radio recording sessions and slowly piecing together the presence I came to believe was Mrs. Henley. Each session brought more whispers, 
fragmented like shards of a long, broken mirror, slowly constructing a narrative of a woman who believed in the power of music to transcend realms. The more I interacted with the radio, the more the initial haunting tune grew familiar and welcoming, as if Mrs. Henley was teaching me to find beauty in what I had first perceived as melancholy. It became clear that these musical sessions were her way of reaching out, maintaining her connection to the house, and perhaps guiding me to see beyond the physical world into the deeper connections that music could forge. The radio, once just an old, dusty object, had become a conduit for a profound experience, a bridge between the past and my present. And through it I learned to listen not only to the notes of a song, but to the echoes of stories long embedded in the walls of my home, carried over the airwaves by a melody that knew no bounds. Story 13 Driving the late night bus route through the winding streets of the city had become more than just a job for me, it was a nightly adventure, a quiet time to think, and occasionally an opportunity to meet some interesting characters. However, nothing on this route had ever been quite as peculiar or haunting as the woman who boarded every night without fail. She would step onto the bus at the downtown stop, always a few minutes before midnight. Dressed in a faded red coat, her presence was accompanied by a faint, unplaceable perfume, a mix of jasmine and something else I couldn't quite identify. She'd pay her fare, smile politely, and take a seat near the back, gazing silently out of the window. Every night she would disembark at the last stop on the line, a dimly lit corner on the edge of town. Her routine was as predictable as my own, yet we rarely exchanged more than a few words, usually just a nod or a quiet thank you as she left, but her consistent presence in the air of melancholy that seemed to cloak her intrigued me. Who was she? Why did she take this late bus every night only to get off at the very last stop? One evening, Driven by curiosity that had built up over the many silent rides, I decided to speak to her. As we neared her usual stop, I called back to her. Excuse me, Ma, I am. If you don't mind me asking, what's your name? I've seen you so many times it feels right to know. She looked up, and for a moment, it seemed like the dim light in the bus flickered, casting shadows that danced across her features. She smiled a warm, sad smile that didn't quite reach her eyes. Anna, she replied softly. Then, as she stepped off the bus, she turned, gave a small wave, and in the blink of an eye, she vanished right before the doors closed. Stunned, I sat there for a moment, staring at the empty spot where she had just stood. Had I imagined that? I shook my head, incredulous, and decided it was just the result of too many hours behind the wheel. The next day I mentioned this incident to a fellow driver during our break. Expecting a laugh or a joke about my overactive imagination, I was instead met with a solemn expression. You said she got off at the old mill stop, right? You do know that stop was discontinued years ago, after a tragic accident. I felt a chill as he recounted the story a story that had somehow escaped me. Years ago, a young woman named Anna returning home late from work, had been struck and killed by a car right at that stop. It was a hit and run, and the driver was never caught. After the incident, the stop was closed due to safety concerns and had remained unused since. The information sent me reeling. It couldn't be a coincidence. The name, the stop, her disappearance had all aligned too perfectly with the ghostly tale my colleague had laid out had I been giving a ride to a ghost every night. Determined to find answers, I visited the local library and dug through old newspapers and public records. The tragic story of Anna, lost so young in such a violent, sudden way, was there just as my friend had described. The articles even included a photo of her a black and white image that unmistakably matched the woman on my bus. Armed with this knowledge, I drove my route that night with a heavy heart. 
the bus felt unusually empty without Anna's presence. As I approached the old mill stop, I paused the bus, staring out into the darkness where she had vanished. I wondered about her life, about the dreams she held that had been cut so short, and about the mysterious bounds of life and death that had allowed her spirit to linger. Compelled by a need to acknowledge her life and perhaps offer her some peace, I spoke into the empty air of the bus. Anna, I don't know if you can hear me, but I learned about what happened to you. I'm so sorry, you're remembered, and I hope you find your way home. The bus was silent, the only sound the idling of the engine and the distant call of a night bird. Nothing dramatic happened, no ghostly apparition, no whisper in the wind, but somehow the atmosphere seemed lighter, as if my words had been heard. Anna never boarded the bus again after that night. Whether she had moved on or simply stopped appearing to me, I couldn't say. But every time I drive past the old mill stop, I think of her. I remember the quiet woman in the red coat who just wanted to go home. The experience changed me, deepening my understanding of the shadows that linger in this world, shadows filled with stories and secrets. Now when I drive my bus through the sleeping city, I keep an eye out for those who might need a ride, seen or unseen, because everyone, regardless of their place in this world or the next, deserves to make it home. Story 14 It started subtly, almost imperceptibly, the gentle tap-pap of footsteps beneath my apartment floor every night. At first I thought little of it. Living in a bustling city apartment building, one becomes accustomed to the symphony of noises neighbors returning late, the distant wail of sirens, the relentless hum of traffic. It was soothing, the rhythmic cadence of those footsteps, a reminder that in the vast labyrinth of the city, we were never truly alone. But then I remembered the apartment below had been empty for months. The previous tenant, Mrs. Halverson, an elderly woman with a penchant for lavender perfume and classical music, had vanished without a trace. One day her melodies filled the air, the next, silence. She probably moved to be closer to her family, people speculated, but no one really knew. The apartment lay vacant, a quiet void in the otherwise bustling building. Curiosity nudged at me each night as the footsteps continued. Soft, measured, they seemed too deliberate, too consistent to be a product of my imagination. I mentioned it casually to my neighbor, Jenna, while we waited for the elevator one evening. Footsteps. In the old Halverson place, that's creepy, Jenna said, her eyes widening. Are you sure? As sure as I'm standing here. Every night, like clockwork, I replied, the elevator dinging as it reached our floor. Maybe you should talk to management, Jenna suggested as she stepped inside the lift. See if they've let someone in to do some work or something. Her words echoed in my mind as I unlocked my apartment door. The stillness of my own space felt suddenly eerie, charged with a strange energy. Resolving to seek answers, I called the building manager the next morning. Footsteps. Below your apartment, mister. Daniels, the manager, sounded perplexed. No, that's not possible. No one has been in there since Mrs. Halverson left. The apartment's been locked, awaiting a new tenant. But I hear it every night. Could someone have a key? Maybe someone staying there without permission I pressed, the possibility unsettling me. Mister. Daniels promised to investigate and hung up. That evening, as the city transitioned from the golds of sunset to the deep blues of twilight, the footsteps resumed. I couldn't stand the mystery any longer. With a flashlight in hand, I decided to head downstairs. The hallway was dimly lit, the light bulbs casting long shadows against the faded wallpaper. I reached the door of the apartment below mine, hesitated, then knocked. Silence greeted me, save for the distant hum of traffic. I pressed my ear to the door, nothing. The rhythmic 
tapping had ceased the moment I stepped out of my apartment. It was as if whoever or whatever was responsible knew of my approach. Frustrated and more than a little unnerved, I returned upstairs. The footsteps began again shortly after midnight. This time, driven by a mix of fear and determination, I recorded the sound on my phone, the proof that I wasn't imagining things. The next morning, armed with my audio evidence, I met Mr. Daniels outside the vacant apartment. His skepticism was evident, but he agreed to open the door. As the door swung open, revealing the untouched living space, a chill ran down my spine. The apartment was exactly as Mrs. Halverson had left it, her furniture still draped in sheets, her last calendar still hung on the wall, its pages untouched since her disappearance. See? Nothing. No one's here, mister, Daniel said, stepping inside. But I wasn't convinced. Listen to this, I insisted, playing the recording. The clear sound of footsteps echoed in the empty room, causing even Mr. Daniels to pale. This doesn't make sense, he muttered, pulling out his phone to call someone. I wandered through the apartment while he talked in hushed tones. In the living room, beneath a window, I noticed something odd a slight discoloration in the carpeting. Curious, I knelt down, touching the spot. It was colder than the surrounding area and was it slightly indented? I shone the flashlight on it, my heart pounding. The light flickered, and for a brief moment I thought I saw something move underneath the floor. Mister. Daniels I called out, my voice shaky. He joined me, frowning as he too noticed the anomaly. We might need to pull up this carpet, he said, more to himself than to me. As he arranged for a maintenance crew, I stood by the window, looking out at the city below. The sun was setting again, casting long shadows across the buildings. Shadows that seemed to whisper secrets. When the maintenance crew arrived and began to work, the atmosphere was tense. As the carpet was peeled back, revealing the floorboards, everyone held their breath. And then we saw it an old, almost imperceptible crack in the floorboards right where the carpet discoloration had been. Could there be something under the floor, one of the workers murmured, reaching for tools to pry open the boards. What lay beneath was not what any of us expected. A small, hidden compartment, long forgotten, perhaps since the building's construction. Inside, we found an assortment of old, dusty items, a locket, some letters, a diary, the contents were mundane, but their existence was a puzzle. Who had hidden these things and why? The discovery didn't explain the footsteps, but it added another layer of mystery to the old building. Perhaps the sounds were a remnant, a memory etched into the very fabric of the place. Or perhaps they were a call, a beckoning to uncover the forgotten stories of those who had once called this building home. The footsteps continued, fainter now, as if satisfied with the attention they had garnered. And while the logical part of me remained skeptical, a deeper, more instinctual part of me wondered if Mrs. Halverson, wherever she was, had somehow guided me to uncover this hidden slice of the past, nestled beneath the floorboards of the empty apartment below. Story 15 when my grandfather passed away, among the relics of his life, I inherited a peculiar watch. Unlike any other watch I had seen, its hands moved in reverse. The inheritance included a note in my grandfather's tight, spidery handwriting to see time as others don't. I laughed at what I assumed was one of his typical cryptic jokes. I decided to wear the watch, intrigued by its anomaly. The first few days were unremarkable aside from the occasional comment about the watch's odd movement. But as days progressed, the effects became unsettlingly apparent. Days seemed to stretch longer than normal, and friends started talking about events and conversations I had no memory of. Remember we met for coffee last Tuesday, they would say, and I'd be lost, no such memory in my mind. 
Initially, I thought it was just stress, my mind playing tricks. But the peculiarities intensified with the watch. I began to see things in reverse order the aftermath of a spilled coffee before I saw it spill, a greeting before the approach. The world seemed to rewind around me, leaving me isolated in my proper timeline. Then, one day, everything stopped. The watch's second hand ceased moving altogether. It was exactly midnight. I went to sleep uneasy, the still hands of the watch imprinted in my mind. When I awoke, I found myself back to the morning when I first put on the watch, as if no days had passed since then. My phone calendar confirmed it, and conversations were eerily similar to what I remembered from what now seemed like a previous cycle. I was determined to understand the phenomenon. Over multiple cycles I documented everything what people said, what I did, even minor details like the weather. Each cycle was identical unless I made deliberate changes. It was as if the watch had bound me to a specific stretch of time, replaying it over and over, and I was the only one aware of the loop. Desperate for answers, I visited a horologist, an expert in the mechanics of timepieces. I explained the situation, omitting the part about time looping for fear of disbelief. The horologist, an elderly man with an understanding gaze, examined the watch closely. This is a very unusual mechanism, he observed, his tools probing the intricacies of the watch. See here? This gear arrangement is custom made, designed to rotate the hands backward. It's quite ingenious, but I must ask, why would someone want a watch like this? Hesitantly, I told him about the time loops that resets everything. To my surprise, he nodded slowly, not doubting but pondering. There are many stories in horology about timepieces crafted with purposes beyond mere timekeeping, he said thoughtfully. Watches that bring luck, watches that predict the future, even watches that are said to manipulate time. Perhaps your grandfather stumbled upon or devised a way to manipulate time through this watch. But how do I stop it? How do I get out of this loop, I asked, desperation creeping into my voice. The horologist advised removing the watch during a reset and never wearing it again. It may be that the watch binds time to the wearer, he suggested. If you break this cycle by not wearing it when time resets, perhaps it will continue without looping. I followed his advice. The next time the watch stopped and everything reset, I left it off. That day passed differently. Events changed subtly as the absence of the watch allowed time to flow normally. The loop was broken. Though relieved, I couldn't part with the watch. It sat on my desk, a constant reminder of the cycles I had lived through, of the time I experienced differently. It had shown me a profound truth time is not just a series of ticks forward but a tapestry woven with the threads of choices, chances and changes. Sometimes I'd find myself staring at the watch, tempted to put it on again, to see the loops, to see time as others didn't. But I resisted. I knew that some aspects of time, much like its keeper, are best left untouched. Story 16 I began working from home at the onset of a global health crisis, setting up a makeshift office in the dining room of my modest two-story house. The adjustment was smooth initially, aided by the quietude that enveloped my suburban neighborhood. However, after a few weeks I began to notice odd occurrences with my phone line. At first it was just static that would occasionally interrupt my calls a common enough annoyance. But then, I started to catch fragments of other people's conversations. The snippets were brief, and usually muffled, but unmistakably not part of my own calls. My telecom provider assured me it was probably cross-talk due to outdated wiring in my area, a plausible explanation that put my mind at ease temporarily. As days turned into weeks, the interference did not cease instead, it evolved. The snippets became clearer, more frequent, and oddly, seemed almost responsive to my presence. 
I could hear bits of mundane chit-chat, but occasionally there were phrases that sounded directly aimed at me warnings. One day, while discussing project timelines with a colleague, a chillingly clear interruption cut through you need to check your house. There's danger I paused, my heart hammering in my chest, certain I had misheard. But then it came again, more insistent, look in the basement. I ended the call under the guise of a bad connection and stood still, listening hard to the silence that had reclaimed my home. The rational part of me reasoned it was stress, an auditory hallucination perhaps. But the warning nagged at me, persistent and unnerving. Later that evening, with a flashlight in one hand and a baseball bat in the other a laughable choice for a weapon, I thought I hesitated at the top of the basement stairs. The air felt cooler, denser as I descended. The basement was largely unfinished, cluttered with boxes of old keepsakes and unused gym equipment. I scanned the room with my flashlight, half expecting to find an intruder hiding behind the Christmas decorations. But there was nothing, just the usual home clutter. Still, I couldn't shake the unease, so I began a meticulous search. Behind piles of boxes and an old, dusty treadmill, I found it a crack in the foundation wall. It was not large, perhaps the length of my hand and no wider than a pencil, but it was new, or at least I had never noticed it before. The days that followed were filled with more interruptions during calls, each more urgent than the last. Seal it before it's too late, the voices implored. I couldn't understand how a small crack could pose such a threat, but the fear instilled by those disembodied warnings was real. I purchased sealant from the local hardware store. A quick fix for what I convinced myself was just a routine house repair. The day I sealed the crack, the calls stopped. Not just the interruptions, the warning ceased completely, as if whoever or whatever had been communicating with me was now satisfied, their mission accomplished. It was an abrupt return to normalcy, one that should have been relieving, yet somehow wasn't. The silence that followed was as unnerving as the cryptic warnings had been. Weeks passed without incident, and I began to let go of the constant edge I had been living on. That was until I decided to move some boxes back against the basement wall I had sealed. As I cleared the area, I noticed something peculiar on the floor of fine, almost imperceptible powder. It was spread out in a line directly below where the crack had been. Curious and cautious, I collected some of the powder in a small container. The next day, I took it to a friend who worked in a chemical lab, half expecting him to tell me it was nothing more than dust. When he called me with the results, his voice was tinged with a seriousness that immediately set me on edge. It's radon, he told me. Your house has been exposed to rat and gas. It's typically harmless in outdoor environments because it disperses quickly, but in enclosed spaces it can be hazardous, even carcinogenic over long-term exposure. The realization hit me like a wave. The mysterious crack had been a vent for radon gas, a silent, invisible danger that had seeped into my home. The voices, whatever their source, had warned me of a threat I couldn't have perceived on my own. In the weeks that followed, I had professionals install a radon mitigation system and further seal and inspect the foundation. The cost was substantial, but the peace of mind it bought was worth every penny. As for the voices, they never returned. Whether it was a fluke, a psychic warning, or something else entirely, I'll never truly know. But I do know this sometimes, help comes from the most unexpected sources, and sometimes danger lies where you least expect to find it. Now I pay a little more attention when the phone line crackles, half expecting to hear a voice guiding me once more. But all I hear is the usual static, a reminder of the time when the ordinary was anything but. Story 17 Every morning, like clockwork, I would wake up to find my shoes neatly placed by the door. It had become a comforting routine, a mundane yet reliable start to each day. But one morning, everything changed. As I stumbled into the hallway, still half asleep, 
I noticed something odd about my shoes. They were not how I had left them the night before. My sleek, black dress shoes had been replaced by a pair that was old, worn, and definitely not mine. Bewilderment washed over me as I stared at the mismatched pair sitting innocently by the door. I searched the entire house, hoping it was some bizarre prank or a momentary lapse in memory, but there was no sign of my missing shoes. With a sigh of resignation, I slipped on the unfamiliar footwear and headed out for the day, the mystery of the mismatched shoes lingering in the back of my mind. The next morning, the scene repeated itself. Once again, my shoes had been swapped out during the night, replaced by a different pair altogether. This time, however, I was prepared. I set up a small camera discreetly positioned in the hallway, hoping to catch the culprit in the act. Night after night, I eagerly checked the footage, hoping for a glimpse of the shadowy figure responsible for the strange phenomenon. And finally, my patience was rewarded. In the dim light of the hallway, I saw a fleeting silhouette darting in and out of frame, deftly swapping my shoes before vanishing into the darkness. My heart raced as I replayed the footage, trying to make out any distinguishing features of the mysterious intruder. But the figure remained frustratingly elusive, nothing more than a blur on the screen. Determined to solve the mystery once and for all, I decided to stay up that night, keeping a vigilant watch over my shoes in the hallway. As the clock ticked past midnight, I sat in the darkness, my eyes trained on the door, waiting for any sign of movement. Hours passed with agonizing slowness, but just as I was beginning to lose hope, I heard a faint creak from the hallway. My heart pounding, I crept towards the door, careful not to make a sound, and there was the shadowy figure, its form barely visible in the dim light. With bated breath, I watched as it approached my shoes, its movements quick and precise. Before I could react, the figure had swapped out my shoes once again, disappearing into the darkness before I could even blink. Frustration bubbled up inside me as I realized that catching the culprit would not be as easy as I had hoped. Determined not to let the mysterious intruder outsmart me, I devoted all my time and energy to unraveling the puzzle. I scoured the internet for any information that might offer a clue, delving into obscure forums and conspiracy theories in search of answers. But the more I searched, the more confused I became. The phenomenon of mismatched shoes seemed to defy all logical explanation, leaving me grasping at straws in a sea of uncertainty. As the days turned into weeks, I became increasingly obsessed with the mystery my thoughts consumed by the enigmatic figure that had infiltrated my life. I barely slept, spending every waking moment analyzing the footage and searching for any shred of evidence that might lead me closer to the truth. But despite my best efforts, the mystery only seemed to deepen. The shadowy figure continued to elude me, its motives shrouded in secrecy. And as the days stretched into months, I began to wonder if I would ever uncover the truth behind the mismatched shoes. Then, one fateful night, everything changed. As I sat in the darkness, my eyes fixed on the hallway, I heard a sound unlike any I had heard before a soft, melodic hum drifting through the air. Intrigued, I followed the sound, my heart pounding with anticipation. And there, standing in the hallway, was the shadowy figure, its form illuminated by the soft glow of moonlight streaming through the window. But this time there was something different about the figure. As I watched, its features began to shift and change, morphing into something altogether unexpected. And then with a start, I realized the truth. The shadowy figure was none other than my own reflection, distorted by the darkness and the passage of time. In my obsession to unravel the mystery, I had become the very thing I sought to uncover a ghostly presence haunting the halls of my own home. With a mixture of relief and regret, I finally understood the truth behind the mismatched shoes. It was not some elaborate prank or sinister plot, but a reflection of my own inner turmoil, manifesting itself in the mundane details of everyday life. 
As the realization washed over me, I felt a weight lift from my shoulders, the grip of obsession loosening its hold. And as I looked down at the mismatched shoes by the door, I couldn't help but smile, knowing that the true mystery had been solved at last. Story 18 Moving into a new house is always an adventure, but for me it came with an unexpected twist. As I settled into my new home, I began to notice strange occurrences that defied all rational explanation. It started with the pet toys. At first I thought nothing of them, dismissing them as remnants left behind by the previous occupants. But as the days passed, the toys seemed to multiply, appearing in the most unlikely places a squeaky ball in the kitchen, a frayed rope toy on the stairs, a crumpled catnip mouse in the living room. Curiosity peaked. I began to investigate, scouring every nook and cranny of the house in search of any sign of a furry friend. But no matter how thorough my search, I found no trace of a pet, no fur, no food bowls, no litter box. At first, I laughed it off as a harmless quirk of my new home, but as the strange occurrences continued, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that settled over me. It was as if an invisible presence lurked just beyond my sight, teasing me with its elusive nature. Determined to get to the bottom of the mystery, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I set up cameras throughout the house, hoping to capture whatever unseen force was responsible for the strange happenings. Night after night, I poured over the footage, searching for any clue that might shed light on the mystery. But try as I might, I found nothing, no shadowy figures, no mysterious movements, nothing but the empty rooms of my seemingly ordinary house. Frustrated and bewildered, I turned to my friends for advice, hoping that they might offer some insight into the strange occurrences. But instead of reassurance, their stories only served to deepen my sense of unease. One friend claimed to have heard faint purring coming from the living room late at night, while another swore they had heard the unmistakable sound of barking echoing through the empty halls. But when pressed for details, they could offer no explanation, only shrugging their shoulders and exchanging nervous glances. As the days turned into weeks, I found myself consumed by the mystery, my thoughts constantly returning to the unseen presence that seemed to haunt my every move. Desperate for answers, I began to take increasingly drastic measures, buying pet food and treats in the hopes of luring whatever invisible creature had taken up residence in my home. To my surprise, the food disappeared overnight, leaving behind only empty bowls and a lingering sense of disbelief. It was as if the invisible pet had accepted my offerings, acknowledging my presence in its own mysterious way. But still, I longed for more a glimpse, a sign, anything that might confirm the existence of the unseen companion that shared my home. And then, one fateful night, my wish was granted in the most unexpected way. As I sat alone in the living room, bathed in the soft glow of lamplight, I heard a faint rustling coming from the corner of the room. Heart pounding, I turned to see a flicker of movement, a shadowy shape darting across the floor. With bated breath, I watched as the shape coalesced into form a sleek, silvery blur that seemed to shimmer in the darkness. And then, as if sensing my presence, it paused, its bright eyes locking with mine in a moment of silent understanding. For the first time, I saw my invisible companion a ghostly cat, its fur tinged with moonlight, its tail swishing lazily as it regarded me with a mixture of curiosity and amusement. And in that moment, all my doubts and fears melted away, replaced by a sense of wonder and awe. From that day forward, the invisible pet became a beloved member of my household, its presence a constant source of comfort and companionship. Though I could never see it in the traditional sense, I felt its presence in every corner of my home, a silent guardian watching over me with unwavering loyalty. And as I looked around at the scattered pet toys and empty food bowls that littered the floor, I couldn't help but smile, grateful for the unexpected blessing that had found its way into my life. 
for in the end it wasn't the visible that mattered, but the invisible a bond forged not by sight, but by the heart. Story 19 The first time I noticed this strange occurrence in my attic, I brushed it off as a simple electrical glitch. The light would flicker on, casting a soft glow through the cracks in the attic door, every night like clockwork. At first it was easy to ignore I chalked it up to faulty wiring or an old switch with a mind of its own. But as the days turned into weeks, and the weeks into months, the persistent glow from the attic began to weigh on my mind. No matter how many times I checked the wiring or called in an electrician, the source of the mysterious light remained elusive, like a phantom haunting the darkest corners of my home. Each time the electrician arrived, he would spend hours painstakingly inspecting every inch of the attic, searching for any sign of a malfunction. But no matter how thorough his investigation, he always came up empty-handed, unable to explain the inexplicable phenomenon that had taken hold of my home. Frustrated and bewildered, I began to wonder if there was more to the attic light than met the eye. Was it possible that something or someone was trying to communicate with me from beyond the grave? The thought sent shivers down my spine, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was a deeper mystery waiting to be uncovered. One fateful night, curiosity finally got the better of me. Unable to resist the pull of the unknown any longer, I mustered up the courage to venture into the attic and confront the source of the mysterious light once and for all. With trembling hands, I pushed open the creaky attic door, its hinges protesting loudly as I ascended the narrow staircase. The air was thick with dust and cobwebs and a musty smell hung heavy in the air, but I pressed on driven by a sense of determination I couldn't quite explain. As I reached the top of the stairs, I hesitated for a moment, my heart pounding in my chest. But then, stealing myself for whatever I might find, I stepped into the dimly lit attic, my eyes scanning the shadows for any sign of movement. To my surprise, the attic was shrouded in darkness, the only light coming from a small window at the far end of the room. Confused, I glanced around, wondering if perhaps the light had finally burned out for good. But as I moved further into the attic, I noticed something strange, a warm spot on the floor, as if someone had been sitting there just moments before. Heart pounding, I knelt down to examine the spot, my fingers trembling as they brushed against the dusty floorboards. There was no denying it, the warmth was real a tangible presence in the otherwise cold and empty attic. But who or what could have left such a mark? And why was the light off when it had been flickering on every night without fail? Unable to shake the feeling of unease that settled over me, I quickly made my way back downstairs, the mystery of the attic light still weighing heavily on my mind. As I lay in bed that night, I couldn't help but wonder what secrets lay hidden within the shadows of my own home. The next day, I resolved to delve deeper into the mystery, determined to uncover the truth behind the strange occurrences in my attic. I spent hours researching old newspaper archives and local history books, searching for any mention of previous occupants or unusual events that might shed light on the situation. But the more I searched, the more frustrated I became. There was nothing, no records of any tragedies or strange happenings in my home, no mention of anyone who might have left behind a lingering presence in the attic. Feeling defeated, I decided to take matters into my own hands. Armed with a flashlight and a sense of determination, I returned to the attic, determined to find answers no matter the cost. As I carefully searched the attic, my flashlight casting long shadows against the dusty walls, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Every creak of the floorboards, every rustle of the wind outside sent a shiver down my spine, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was not alone in the darkness. And then, just as I was about to give up hope, I saw it a faint glimmer of light, barely visible in the far corner of the attic. Heart pounding, I made my way towards it, 
my footsteps echoing loudly in the empty space. As I drew closer, the light grew brighter, casting an ethereal glow that seemed to dance and flicker in the darkness. And then, with a shock, I realized the truth the light was not coming from any electrical source, but from something far more mysterious and otherworldly. With trembling hands, I reached out to touch the source of the light, my fingers brushing against the cool surface of a long-forgotten lantern. It was old and weathered, covered in dust and cobwebs, but there was something undeniably magical about it, a sense of history and mystery that seemed to emanate from its very core. As I examined the lantern more closely, I noticed something strange, a series of intricate symbols etched into the metal, their meaning lost to time. And then, as if guided by some unseen force, I found myself drawn to a small compartment hidden within the lantern's base. With bated breath, I opened the compartment, revealing a faded piece of parchment tucked inside. It was a letter, written in a language I couldn't understand, but as I read the words aloud, a sense of understanding washed over me, as if the secrets of the attic had finally been laid bare. The letter spoke of a love lost long ago, of a promise made beneath the light of the stars, and of a lantern that held the power to bridge the gap between the living and the dead. It was a tale of heartbreak and redemption of souls bound together by fate and circumstance, and of a love that transcended time and space. As I read the final words of the letter, a sense of peace washed over me, and I knew that I had uncovered the truth behind the mysterious light in the attic. It was not a glitch or a malfunction, but a message from beyond the grave, a reminder that love endures, even in the darkest of times. And as I descended from the attic, the lantern clutched tightly in my hand, I knew that I would carry its light with me always, a beacon of hope and understanding in a world filled with mystery and wonder. Story 20 it was a crisp autumn morning when I stumbled upon the old camera at a neighborhood yard sale. Nestled among a jumble of forgotten treasures, it caught my eye a relic from another era, its leather casing worn and weathered with age. Intrigued by its vintage charm, I couldn't resist the urge to purchase it, eager to unlock the secrets hidden within its dusty frame. As I made my way home, the camera clutched tightly in my hand, I couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement building within me. What wonders lay waiting to be discovered on the rolls of film tucked away inside? What stories had this camera witnessed in its long and storied life? With trembling hands, I carefully pried open the back of the camera, half expecting to find the film degraded and unusable after years of neglect. But to my surprise, the film appeared to be in pristine condition as if waiting patiently for someone to breathe new life into it once more. Filled with anticipation, I set to work developing the film, watching with bated breath as the images slowly began to take shape on the glossy paper. And then, as the last photograph emerged from the dark room, my breath caught in my throat, my heart pounding with a mixture of excitement and trepidation. The photographs depicted scenes from a bygone era, a family gathered around a picnic table, children laughing and playing in the sunshine, parents smiling fondly at the camera. But what struck me most was the setting the familiar backdrop of my own house. Its distinctive red door and white picket fence unmistakable, even in the faded black and white images. I stared at the photographs in disbelief my mind racing with a thousand questions. Who were these people? And why were they posing in front of my house decades before I had even set foot in the neighborhood? Determined to unravel the mystery, I set out to investigate, scouring old newspapers and city records in search of any mention of the family captured in the photographs. But try as I might, I found no trace of them, no birth certificates no marriage licenses, no obituaries to shed light on their enigmatic past. Frustrated and perplexed, I turned to the only clue I had the camera itself. With its sleek lines and vintage design, 
It was a model I recognized from my research as a popular choice in the 1950s, a time when my house was nothing more than a dream in the minds of its future occupants. But how could photographs taken over half a century ago depict scenes that seemed so recent, so vividly alive? It was a question that haunted me day and night, driving me to the brink of obsession as I searched for answers that seemed to slip through my fingers like grains of sand. As the days turned into weeks, I found myself drawn deeper into the mystery. My thoughts consumed by the images that seemed to stare back at me from the pages of history. Who were these people, and what connection did they have to my house? And perhaps most importantly, why had their story been forgotten, lost to the passage of time like so many others before it? Determined to find the truth, I embarked on a journey that would take me to the very heart of the mystery, uncovering secrets that had long been buried beneath the surface of my seemingly ordinary life. With each new discovery, the pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place, revealing a story that was as tragic as it was extraordinary. The family in the photographs had once called my house their home, their laughter and tears echoing through its halls like whispers from the past. But their happiness had been short-lived, cut short by a series of events that had torn them apart and left their memory all but forgotten by the world. And yet, somehow, their legacy lived on, captured forever in the timeless images that had found their way into my hands. As I stood in front of my house, the old camera clutched tightly in my hands. I felt a sense of connection to the family and the photographs of shared history that transcended time and space. And as I looked up at the familiar red door, I couldn't help but wonder what other secrets lay hidden within its walls, waiting to be uncovered by those brave enough to seek them out. Story 21 The day I stumbled upon the old recipe book at the flea market, I had no idea the strange and unexpected journey it would lead me on. It lay tucked away in a dusty corner, its pages yellowed with age and its cover adorned with faded floral patterns. But it was the note tucked inside that caught my attention a warning, written in spidery handwriting use with caution. Intrigued by the mysterious message, I couldn't resist the urge to purchase the book, despite the uneasy feeling that gnawed at the pit of my stomach. Little did I know, that decision would set into motion a series of events that would turn my world upside down. The first time I opened the recipe book, I was filled with a sense of excitement and anticipation. Flipping through its pages, I found a treasure trove of culinary delights recipes for dishes I had never heard of, ingredients I couldn't pronounce, and cooking techniques that seemed straight out of a bygone era. Eager to put the recipes to the test, I decided to start with a simple dish of hearty stew, rich with herbs and spices, simmered to perfection over a slow fire. But as I stirred the pot, a strange sensation washed over me a feeling of being watched of not being alone in the kitchen. I shook off the feeling, chalking it up to an overactive imagination, but as the stew bubbled and steamed on the stove, a knock sounded at the door, a knock that sent shivers down my spine. Cautiously, I made my way to the door, my heart pounding in my chest, and there, standing on the doorstep, was a stranger, a man with kind eyes and a warm smile, his face familiar yet somehow unknown to me. Before I could utter a word, he spoke, his voice tinged with a hint of nostalgia. Hello, old friend, he said, as if we were long lost companions reunited at last. I couldn't resist the smell of your cooking, it reminds me of home. Confused and more than a little unnerved, I invited him in, eager to learn more about the stranger who claimed to know me so well, but as quickly as he had appeared, he was gone leaving behind nothing but a lingering sense of unease in a half-finished bowl of stew. As the days passed, the strange occurrences only grew more frequent. Each time I cooked a dish from the recipe book, a new guest would appear on my doorstep, each one claiming to know me from a time long past, each one sharing stories of events I couldn't remember and faces I couldn't place. Some claimed to be childhood friends, others distant relatives or former neighbors, but no matter their story, 
They all shared one thing in common. They knew details about my life that I had long since forgotten. Memories that seemed to belong to someone else entirely. Desperate for answers, I turned to the recipe book, hoping to uncover the truth behind the mysterious guests who seemed to haunt my every meal. But the more I searched, the more elusive the answers became the pages of the book offering no explanation for the strange phenomenon that had taken hold of my life. Frustrated and confused, I began to question my own sanity, wondering if I was simply imagining the whole thing, or if there was some deeper, darker force at play. But no matter how hard I tried to rationalize the events unfolding around me, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being drawn into something far beyond my control. And then, one fateful evening, as I prepared to cook yet another dish from the recipe book, a voice sounded in my ear, a voice that sent a chill down my spine and made my blood run cold. Used with caution, it whispered, its words echoing in the empty kitchen. And in that moment, I knew that the recipe book held secrets far more dangerous than I could have ever imagined. With a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, I made a decision to rid myself of the recipe book once and for all, to banish it from my life and never look back. But as I reached for the book, a gust of wind swept through the kitchen, sending its pages fluttering open to a recipe I had never seen before, a recipe for a dish so tempting, so irresistible, that I couldn't resist the will, that I couldn't resist the urge to try it. And as I cooked the dish, a sense of dread washed over me the knowledge that I was playing with forces beyond my comprehension. But it was too late to turn back now, too late to undo the chain of events that had been set into motion. And so I cooked, my hands trembling as I followed the recipe to the letter, each ingredient a piece of the puzzle that had brought me to this moment. And as the dish simmered on the stove, a familiar knock sounded at the door and I knew that whatever lay on the other side would change my life forever. Story 22 It was a crisp autumn morning when I set out on my usual hiking route, eager to lose myself in the beauty of the wilderness that surrounded me. As I trekked through the dense forest, my footsteps crunching on the fallen leaves beneath my feet, I stumbled upon a trail that seemed to beckon me forward, an unmarked path that whispered of secrets waiting to be discovered. Intrigued by the mystery of the unknown, I decided to follow the trail, my curiosity overriding any sense of caution that might have held me back. As I ventured deeper into the forest, the sounds of civilization faded away, replaced by the quiet rustle of leaves in the breeze and the distant chirping of birds overhead. With each step, the trail seemed to lead me further and further off the beaten path, weaving its way through thick undergrowth and winding around ancient trees that towered overhead. And then, just when I began to wonder if I had lost my way entirely, I emerged into a clearing a clearing unlike any I had ever seen before. Before me lay a small, untouched village its quaint cottages nestled among rolling hills and lush green fields. Smoke curled lazily from chimneys, and the sound of children's laughter echoed through the air as seen straight out of a storybook, frozen in time. I stood there in awe, my heart pounding with excitement as I took in the sight before me. Who were the people who lived in this hidden village, and how had they managed to remain hidden from the outside world for so long? It was a mystery that begged to be solved, a puzzle waiting to be unraveled. With trembling hands, I approached the nearest cottage, the door creaking open on rusty hinges as I stepped inside. The interior was cozy and inviting, filled with the warmth of a crackling fire and the scent of freshly baked bread. And there, sitting at the kitchen table, was a woman, a woman with kind eyes and a welcoming smile her face eerily familiar yet unknown to me. Welcome, traveler, she said, her voice soft and melodic. We don't often receive visitors here, but you are welcome to stay as long as you like. 
Grateful for her hospitality, I spent the day exploring the village, getting to know its inhabitants and soaking in the tranquil beauty of my surroundings. But as the sun began to sink below the horizon, a sense of unease settled over me, a feeling that I did not belong, that I was intruding on a world that was not meant for me. And so, with a heavy heart, I bid farewell to the village and its inhabitants, promising to return someday soon. But as I retraced my steps along the trail, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss that the village and its people were not what they seemed. When I returned home, I couldn't stop thinking about the mysterious village and the strange encounter I had experienced. Determined to uncover the truth, I scoured maps and hiking guides, searching for any mention of the unmarked trail that had led me there. But try as I might, I found nothing, not a single clue to the existence of the hidden village that had captured my imagination. Frustrated and bewildered, I returned to the forest, hoping to find the trail once more and prove to myself that I hadn't imagined the whole thing. But no matter how hard I searched, the trail remained elusive, its secrets hidden from view, as if swallowed up by the forest itself. Desperate for answers, I turned to the locals, hoping that they might shed some light on the mystery that had consumed my thoughts. But to my surprise, they denied any knowledge of the village or the trail that led to it, insisting that such a place could not possibly exist. It's just your imagination, my dear, they said, exchanging nervous glances as if afraid to speak of the village aloud. There is no hidden village in these woods, no trail off the beaten path. You must have dreamed it all. But I knew better I had seen the village with my own eyes, felt the warmth of its people's hospitality, and heard the laughter of its children ringing in my ears. And yet, no matter how hard I tried to convince myself that it was real, a part of me couldn't shake the feeling that it had all been nothing more than a dream. And so I returned to the forest time and time again, searching for the trail that had led me to the hidden village hoping against hope that I might find it once more. But each time, my efforts were in vain, the trail vanishing without a trace as if taunting me with its elusiveness. In the end, I had no choice but to accept the truth that the hidden village and its inhabitants existed only in my memories, a fleeting glimpse into a world that was as mysterious as it was enchanting. And as I closed my eyes and let the forest embrace me, I couldn't help but wonder if I would ever uncover the truth behind the vanishing trail and the secrets it held within its depths. Story 23 Moving into a new home is supposed to be an exciting adventure, a fresh start in a new place filled with promise and possibility. But for me, it quickly became a journey into the unknown, haunted by the echoes of a past that refused to be forgotten. It all started with the old answering machine that came with the house a relic from a bygone era, its mechanical whir and click a stark contrast to the sleek, modern devices of today. As I unpacked my belongings and settled into my new surroundings, I couldn't help but feel a sense of nostalgia for simpler times when communication was a tangible thing that could be held in the palm of your hand. But my nostalgia soon turned to unease when I discovered that the answering machine contained a single message, a message, a message that sent a chill down my spine with its simplicity and urgency. Come home soon. The voice was unfamiliar, its tone tinged with a sense of urgency that left me feeling unsettled. Who was calling, and why were they so desperate for someone to return home? It was a question that gnawed at the back of my mind, refusing to be ignored. Determined to put the strange message out of my thoughts, I deleted it from the answering machine and went about my day, trying to convince myself that it was nothing more than a prank or a wrong number. But when I returned home that evening, the message was back, its presence a constant reminder of the mysteries that lurked within the walls of my new home. Each day, I deleted the message, only to find it reappear the next morning, like a stubborn ghost that refused to be banished. It was as if the answering machine itself was trying to tell me something, a message from the past that demanded to be heard. As the days turned into weeks, 
I grew increasingly frustrated by the relentless persistence of the message, its words echoing in my mind long after I had silenced the machine. Who was calling and why did they want someone to come home so desperately? Unable to bear the uncertainty any longer, I decided to take matters into my own hands. One evening, as I stood in front of the answering machine, the message playing on a loop in the background, I made a decision. Enough I said out loud, my voice firm with determination. I'm home. For a moment there was silence a deafening stillness that seemed to fill the room with its weight. And then, with a soft click, the message disappeared, leaving behind nothing but the steady hum of the machine. I stood there in stunned silence, my heart pounding in my chest as I realized what had just happened. The message was gone, banished by my words as if they held the power to break the spell that had held it captive for so long. And as I looked around the room, a feeling of relief washed over me, the tension that had gripped the house dissipating like fog in the morning sun. It was as if the answering machine had been waiting for someone to acknowledge its presence, to acknowledge the message that had haunted it for so long. From that day forward, the answering machine remained silent, its mechanical whir and click a comforting reminder of the power of words to bring peace and closure to the ghosts of the past. And as I settled into my new home, I couldn't help but feel a sense of gratitude for the strange and unexpected journey that had brought me here, a journey into the unknown that had ultimately led me back to myself. Story 24 Every year on the morning of my birthday, I wake to find a beautifully wrapped gift waiting for me at my doorstep, a mysterious package that seems to materialize out of thin air, its contents shrouded in secrecy. And every year, as I tear away the wrapping paper and open the box, I am greeted by the same sight a book titled Life's Missed Moments. At first I dismiss the strange occurrence as a coincidence, a quirky tradition perhaps, orchestrated by a well-meaning friend or family member. But as the years passed and the gifts continued to arrive, I couldn't help but wonder about the true origin of the mysterious book and the stories it contained. Inside the pages of life's missed, missed moments I found tales of events and experiences that I had no memory of moments of joy and sorrow, triumph and defeat, described in vivid detail as if they had been plucked from the recesses of my own mind. And yet, try as I might, I couldn't recall a single one of them, couldn't shake the feeling that they belonged to someone else entirely. Each year, as I delved deeper into the pages of the book, I found myself consumed by a sense of longing and curiosity, a desire to uncover the truth behind the mysterious chapters that seemed to hold the key to a past I had long since forgotten. Determined to unravel the mystery, I embarked on a journey of self-discovery retracing my steps through the tangled web of memories and emotions that lay hidden within the pages of life's missed moments. With each new chapter I uncovered secrets and revelations that challenged everything I thought I knew about myself, forcing me to confront the truth of who I really was and the person I had once been. But try as I might, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that settled over me a nagging sense of doubt that whispered in the back of my mind, urging me to question everything I thought I knew about my own identity. And then, on the morning of my 35th birthday, a new chapter appeared in life's missed moments, a chapter unlike any I had seen before. Instead of recounting events from my past, it told the story of a future yet to come, a future filled with possibilities and potential, but also with uncertainty and doubt. As I read the words on the page, my heart skipped a beat, my mind racing with a thousand questions. How could the book know what lay ahead for me? And what did it mean for my own destiny? Determined to find answers, I set out to uncover the truth behind the mysterious book and the stories it contained. But the more I searched, the more elusive the answers became, slipping through my fingers like grains of sand as I struggled to make sense of the puzzle that lay before me. And then, just when I was on the brink of giving up hope, 
A breakthrough occurred a chance encounter with an old friend who claimed to know the truth behind the mysterious book and its enigmatic author. According to my friend, the book was the work of a reclusive writer who had once lived in the same neighborhood as me, a writer who had possessed a rare gift for capturing the essence of life's most precious moments in words. But as talented as the writer had been, they had also been plagued by their own demons' demons that had driven them to retreat from the world and disappear without a trace, leaving behind nothing but the legacy of their words and the mystery of their identity. Determined to uncover the truth, I set out to track down the elusive author, following a trail of clues that led me deep into the heart of the city and beyond. And then, just when I was on the brink of giving up hope, I stumbled upon a hidden archive containing the writer's personal belongings, a treasure trove of memories and mementos that shed light on the true nature of the mysterious book and the stories it contained. As I sifted through the artifacts of the writer's life, I felt a sense of connection, a connection to a stranger whose words had touched my soul in ways I couldn't begin to explain. And as I read the final pages of life's missed moments, I realized that the greatest gift of all had been the journey itself, a journey of self-discovery and revelation that had brought me back to myself in ways I never thought possible. 